Welcome everyone. Hello, hello. <laughs> Get no respect here. Uh, welcome everyone to our uh, June meeting, reconvening from closed session. And uh, I would like to report that the board has uh, concluded its annual evaluation of the superintendent president. And I have shared that evaluation with Mr. Calvin. So with that, could I ask you all to please stand? And I will have the pleasure of leading you in the flag salute today. Ready? Salute. I have pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, at this time, uh, under public comment, uh, per board policy 2350, any person may address the board at this time, either on an agenda item or other matters of interest to the public that are within a subject matter jurisdiction of the board. A maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker with the maximum time of 15 minutes per item unless otherwise uh, extended by the board. So at this time I would ask if there are any uh, public comments concerning items that are on the agenda. Uh, appearing to be none, I would ask if there are any public comments concerning items that are not on the agenda. And none as well. Uh, moving on, we will not have a student uh, report today. Uh, I suspect, and so I will uh, ask for board member reports at this time, starting with uh, Mr. Sherman. Um, the only thing I would say is that I attended the graduation and enjoyed it as usual. Uh, likewise, I want to say that uh, officially uh, joining the board in December, one of the things I was looking forward to uh, the most was graduation. And it was everything I, I hoped it would be and more, and it was really nice to see the smiles not only of the students, but also the parents, how proud they were taking photos. Uh, it was really great. The, actually, the whole season, because there was quite a few different ceremonies and certificates, and so I, I enjoyed uh, a few of those events, and i um, very proud to be a representative of, of COS. Ditto. I, you know, it was a, an amazing evening. You know, you could see the, the different emotions in the, in the students as they would come forward. You know, some of them were satisfied, some of them were complete, some of them were scared so you know, it, was, uh, it was it was nice to um, have the honor to represent the college in one of their final interactions mm -hmm. yeah so thank you for that yep ditto I agree I will say though after all these years that was the first one that I brought my umbrella to so yeah. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had a chance of rain since I've been on the board and I haven't I've only missed one graduation so that was kind of new but we made it through without rain so thank you God, because that might have been a little ugly. Because <laughs> it looked like it wanted a storm for a it little did. bit. I'm like, oh, we might lose our crowd. Although, I don't know how they would have gotten to their cars. Yeah. They were parked all the way to Mooney almost. So I'm, that would have, they would have all gotten wet, I'm sure. But a lot of them did have umbrellas. So no, thank you for everyone who put that on. It was very well orchestrated. Uh, speaking of graduation, uh, uh, I was not able to attend, but uh, I was checking my phone where I was to, to check on the weather. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking, Man, it's just going to rain. Like I don't know how we do how you dodged it, but uh, if I would have been there, I know it would have rained. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, we ordered the day before. Uh, it's amazing how Amazon can respond. We had 600 rain ponchos overnighted to us. We had those, and then I think we had 120 or 150 small umbrellas that we were going to put three or four per line rain ponchos. We were prepared. We, we covered everything electronic, um, and yep. we were prepared for mm -hmm. it. And, and, and we were, the show was going to go on. We were going to condense it down, but the show was going to go on. Very well. All right, so uh, at this time, I would also, I'm sorry. I wanted Raymond? to mention, uh, I thought I saw on the seats that they had a uh, license plate. Is that correct? Were That's they the correct. alumni for the foundation? Our I thought foundation, it was a nice, yeah, nice touch. Our, our foundation gives away uh, a license plate frame, an alumni license plate frame to all of our graduates. Yeah, very nice. Very good. So uh, um, 
I would like to report that the board recently also concluded its self-evaluation that was begun uh, back at our uh, board retreat in January, and we will use this information to guide our efforts uh, as a board in the future. So uh, it took us, took us a long time to evaluate ourselves. Uh, it was the two new board members. They were slow. Work there. <laughs> I think it was, it was the work they had to do with the president. <laughs> on your job. Blame it on the new board members. So uh, we can check that off the list. Or we could blame it on the old board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't see uh, Mr. Uh, moving on to uh, 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 foundation report. I don't see Mr. Foster here, and I don't suspect. Uh, He's finishing his year as Rotary Club president. Here in town, and they had an event at Camp Royal, and uh, he did not have a report tonight. Looks forward to seeing you in July. Okay, accreditation report, Dr. Lacerna. I could have done no report, but I decided I better have a really short one, so I'm going to hand you guys a really <coughs> short one, and it just says that uh, the accreditation work group met um, May 30th or May 20th, excuse me, and started looking at the new uh, our next. ICER, what our midterm report's going to look like, the quality focus essay, and started looking at who our new members are going to be because we have some folks who are leaving. So we'll be working with um, President Calvin and the Academic Senate to appoint a few new members to the work group. We'll continue to meet probably once or twice a semester until uh, our mid-year report, our midterm reports due, and then our next, oh, that's due October 17, 2022. Okay. Yes. Good. That's it. Thank you. All right, then I'm going to turn it over to uh, President Calvin for his report and some introductions, it looks like. Sounds good. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't have much more to um, share other than, than uh, these, these introductions. But I would like to, since we're talking about graduation, commend uh, Debbie Douglas for the fabulous job that she did coordinating graduation. and. Um, uh, getting all of those volunteers to, to be where they were supposed to be at the right time, and then thank uh, faculty, staff, and administrators for coming out. And uh, that was our largest, not only our largest graduating class, but our largest group of faculty and staff to participate. So it really was a fun evening. So thanks to everybody for, for that. Um, and I'd like to call back up, I think, uh, Dr. Lacerna, yep. um, to make a few um, introductions. All right, so the first person I get to introduce is one of our new faculty, uh, Chris Huff, if Chris can come up and join me. Um, uh, Dr. Russell would normally have done this introduction, but he is, uh, he's off in Kansas doing a graduation for his son or something. So um, I get to introduce uh, Chris. And so um, if you guys, this is a replacement. We had a retirement of a long-term faculty member, Frank Tebow, from our welding department. And so we were able to um, hire a new faculty member. And um, Chris is a COS alumni. And he's spent the last 12 years in industry as a welding and welding supervisor. Uh, for the last two years, he served as the welding shop aide in Artillery College Center and as an adjunct welding instructor. And um, he's an exemplar in the industrial community of who we want teaching our students. He is well regarded and well respected okay. across the state, not only for his welding craft, but, for, but as a foreman and project lead. His specialty is stainless steel purge welding. It is integral to safe food handling and the medical field. Thank you, Thad, for writing this all down for me. <laughs> you can tell I, I did a lot of research. Uh, several hospital builds and modifications through the valley include his work where he was responsible for the stainless plumbing that carries essential gases throughout these facilities. These joints absolutely must be perfect 100% of the time. And when lives matter, Chris is the only person they enlist to make that weld. So Chris taught two years at the Visalia Adult School, where his students quickly gained the noted reputation among employers for not only having strong technical skills, but soft skills, communication, timeliness, organization, reliabilities <laughs> that our employers insist upon. Adi additionally, he is an accomplished potter with several works featured in galleries along the Central Coast host. And so I would like to introduce to you all Chris Huff. Hey. Wow, thanks uh, everybody <laughs> and Thad. Uh, uh, good evening. Um, you know the last 12 years or so as, as a 
welder, pipe fitter, foreman in, uh, in our local welding industry here, uh, probably the biggest thing that I saw was the skills gap between employers that I saw and, and employers that I worked for importing welders from Wisconsin and Minnesota to come here and build our cheese factories and our wineries and work in our hospital construction. And that, that didn't really set right with me. So about five years ago, I made a, a pretty drastic career change and decided to become part of the solution to uh, reducing unemployment in our community. And I sincerely want to thank the board and Mr. Calvin for allowing me the opportunity to, to partner with you guys in, in achieving, achieving that goal. Uh, thank you. Questions for uh, for Chris? I would say thank you for choosing COS. I think we're we're on the receiving end of some some great talent, and thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, kind. Uh, Chris, can I uh, yes, sir. just from the standpoint of uh, uh, as you said, there's a there's a tremendous need for for this type of uh, employee now. How, how do how do your classes? Uh, are the classes full? Is there a waiting list, or is there, there is. not the? Oh yeah. So they, they, they are, every one of them is, is uh, waitlisted right now. How long does it take them to get up to speed? So uh, it, it, it really depends, again, on the individual. So we, you know, one of the first things as an instructor I do is I, I work with them and, and try to anticipate where the individual is and kind of meet them and what their goals are and help them to succeed on, on what their expectation is. But it, it really goes. I've had, I've had one student start. He learned how to TIG weld, and right away, within two days, this was at, at the adult school, I, I learned right away this guy is going to be a far better welder than me, you, you know. And he, he hit the ground running. Uh, actually, he ended up leaving my class because he got a job. So he was trying to balance that, and I said, go do it, you know, go into it. And he started at $16 an hour right off the bat after about a month of training. And uh, last I... Uh, he started at 16. He's at 18 now, about a year later. So it, it, it really depends on the individual, you know, but um, it's certainly, um, there's certainly that potential. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yep. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So I also have the honor of introducing the first of our three deans to be introduced tonight. So if I can ask Francisco Banuelos to come forward. So um, Francisco is our new Dean of Math and Science and Engineering. And as you all are aware that uh, Dr. Robert Urtecho uh, is retiring at the end of this month. And so um, Francisco will be our new Dean. Um, he comes to us, uh, he had worked for 19 years at West Hill, uh, not sorry, West Hills, that's where he is now, but he, wa he was 19 years at Modesto Junior College. And um, he started there after teaching. He taught job skills. Uh, he was a job skills instructor and started at MJC as a CalWORKs job developer. And then he was a director of their TRIO programs, two upward brown uh, programs and an education talent search. He became an associate dean. And then his last position there was dean of enrollment services. And so he spent a really long time at Modesto Junior College. Then um, a couple of years ago, he transferred over um, and followed his vice president who became president of West Hills College Kalinga and he was hired there as the executive vice president at West Hills College Kalinga so he had student services and academic services and they did a restructuring and split those positions apart so he currently serves as the vice president of student services at um, West Hills College Kalinga and so he um, has served on numerous committees in various roles he's been the accreditation li liaison officer he's co chaired or chaired accreditation both at MJC and at uh, Kalinga uh, curriculum program review budget student learning outcomes their behavioral intervention team and their safety and facilities committees um, he is currently living in Hanford and he has four children and one grandchild and so um, we are really excited he's very um, prepared and we're looking forward to having him step in this new role. I uh, got to know him really well over the fa past few years in our uh, statewide uh, chief instructional officer committee, our, our workshops and our uh, conferences and those kinds of things. So really excited to have him on board. So please welcome Francisco Banuelos. Good afternoon. It's actually, um, I take really a uh, high honor 
to work right by uh, besides Dr. Lacerna. She's highly regarded at, as one of the top CIOs in the States. And when I became uh, a first rookie CIO at West Hills College Kalinga, she definitely mentored me. Uh, my, my wife, my kids, my granddaughter, we settled in Hanford. And um, my colleague and close friend and mentor, um, President uh, Timms and I, we settled. Uh, we, we, had an, we had a plan. We wanted to get West Hills College Kalinga out of all the sanctions that uh, we had. And after we've done that, we restructured Kalinga. And now it's time to get closer to home, be a good uh, grandfather, and, uh, and be part of this team. Heard great, great things of COS. And, uh, and honestly, this was the first position I applied to. And I'm very glad that um, I'm joining this team. You're welcome. Thank you. So you said closer to home. Where, where was home originally? Uh, Hanford. Oh, it we, is? When, when we moved from Modesto, we, it just happened. Things happened for a reason. We put in multiple bids in the city of Kalinga. Um, nothing came uh, to fruition. We moved a little bit to Lemoore, and nothing happened. And after staying at the Sequoia Inn for about a month, uh, my, my kids and my family were ready to find, and we found a developer that guaranteed us a home in 15 days uh, in Hanford, and they, they completed, and we, we settled there. My kids love it. We love the whole community. And my wife uh, opened up uh, her business uh, in Hanford, and so we've, uh, we've been enjoying this community a lot. Thank you, Francisco. Pleasure to have you. All right. Uh, now we're going to welcome up Vice President Morrison, who will make our final two introductions. As, as Jenny is coming up, I just wanted to uh, give a thank you to President Calvin for all his help on graduation day. I don't know how many college presidents I could call and say, please help me carry pop-ups from <laughs> storage and from the transfer center. And oh, wait, there's one more back in the transfer center. And we were sweaty and bruised. And um, I just know from other places I've worked that it would be rare that a president <laughs> college would drop everything for about five hours and help us shield the rain. I so felt like an athletic director again. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like a soccer mom again. So, um, but anyway, thank you. I appreciated that. OK, so come on up. Or Jenny. She's like, am I going to have to say something? Yes. <laughs> and she's very talkative. She'll be fine. Um, so uh, this is Jenny Say Chow. I feel like I'm so big standing in front of you. So um, Jenny has a bachelor's degree in business administration and management from Fresno State and a master's degree from National University in organizational leadership. Uh, additionally, Jenny has multiple professional certificates, ranging from creating customer service building team to building teams for the future to managing projects and priorities. And so this is exciting in student services because that's what we do all day long. Um, Jenny's career in higher education began as a student worker at Fresno State as a learning resource center assistant, but was swiftly hired by Heald College as their learning resource center manager. So from student worker to manager in a very similar field. So so that's quite an accomplishment. Um, from there within Heal, Jenny was there for about 15 years um, and had was promoted four or five times, as I can see on your resume, um, all the way from Associate Dean of Students to finally Director of Academic Affairs and, and about three other managerial positions in between. Jenny has also served as a counselor for Fresno State and most recently has served as the Director of Education for the Institute of Technology in Clovis. Uh, Jenny was able to attend our recent Management Institute and is already fitting in greatly with our team, has a tremendous sense of humor, positive outlook, and has been a joy to be around. Um, we are so excited to add Jenny's immense managerial experience to our team. Um, and one thing kind of funny about Jenny and I that we share in common that we learned at the Management Institute over lunch is I was grabbing something out of my purse and I carry an EpiPen in there for my son with a peanut allergy and she has one too. So <laughs> she understood the needles in my, in my bag. Uh, so without further ado, here's Jenny. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thank you, Jessica. I just, as I was sharing with the interview panel just a couple weeks ago, uh, ever since I got into higher education, I always had this, because I grew up from here, I went to Golden West, I think I had the same life, uh, 
career, I mean, you know, school journey as I wanted. We went to Crowley, Valley Oak. I am also proud that I was Bronco Girl of the Year there. You know, I have to remember that. You know, it takes a lot back. I don't know if they still do Student of the Year anymore, but I was Bronco of the Girl. You know, so I was excited. I, still, I saw that plaque the other day. And then also, and then Golden West. So it was really exciting to see that we have the same path. But I always, once I got into, at Hill College, I said to myself, my goodness, what I'm doing here, I love it. One day, I absolutely really would love to just go back to Visea and work at College of Sequoias. Either the timing wasn't right back then, or I was in different roles. But this is just a true dream come true, come true for me. I'm so excited. I've already, I'm having a blast. I've been taking selfies and posting on Facebook, all the different trees. I go, they don't just have this, they have a botanical garden over here. I told my husband, he didn't believe me. But, um, but he goes, are you sure that's not from the zoo somewhere? And I say, no, it is really as a COS. Um, but I couldn't believe how beautiful. I mean, I remember coming here for summer school, uh, I, I, but I was so young back then. I didn't realize, realize how beautiful it was until coming back. And I've worked at different other institutions. I just have to say, this is such a beautiful campus. And I just want to also just end on a uh, note that I am so impressed just in the six days that I've been here. Uh, everyone's just been truly so welcoming and allow me to ask so many questions and learn and just pop into their office and introduce myself. So thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. OK, shall we excuse her? <laughs> All right. Jenny, oh, afterwards, you can have a selfie with uh, <laughs> President Nunes. <laughs> Put that on your Facebook. <laughs> OK, so the next um, dean that we were able to hire, so it was really exciting. If you recall, we went from a two-dean structure to a three-dean structure, um, and that was really to save the lives of the two deans that we had <laughs> working. So um, Juan Vasquez uh, received his associate's degree in liberal studies and was a student athlete at the College of the Sequoias, then transferred to Sacramento State to receive a bachelor's in psychology and then a master's degree in higher education leadership. And apparently, you were kind of a track star there as well, right? <laughs> I asked him today, did you run at Sac State? That was an insult. So he's like a record holder, that if you guys want to find out what that record is. Um, anyway, uh, Juan's career in high, higher education began as an athletic counselor at UC Davis, which then led to a student athlete support services coordinator at Cal State Bakersfield. Juan later pursued a management position at UC Riverside as the director of academic success. Then in January of 2015, we were fortunate to have Juan apply and receive the Director of Student Success position at the College of the Sequoias. I can proudly say that Juan was an excellent hire, as he went on to lead many of the efforts spelled out in the equity plan, which we'll hear about later tonight, specifically implementing our vision of having five student success centers district-wide. Juan connects really well with students, staff, and faculty, and is an absolute pleasure to work with. Jessica, uh, thank you, board. Thank you, President Kelvin, and, and actually thank you to all the, the senior uh, management team here uh, for their guidance through the last four and a half years. Um, I've loved loved my time being back back home, uh, and and I consider Visalia COS my home, born and raised in Visalia, um, and I'm excited for the for the future. I've I've loved every peak, every part, every challenge that I've that I've had here, and and I really look forward to to working with Jenny, um, uh, current Dean uh, Michelle Brock, the rest of the team here. So thank you. What was your award? Oh, so. <laughs> you're, you're kind of a big deal. So we don't ask you. So, so when, when I left as a student athlete here, Brent was the athletic director. Um, so to First day I met him, he almost hit me with the school band, <laughs> band by the way. <laughs> so so I, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, I, I did receive a scholarship to, to Sacramento State, and it was part of the distance medley relay. Oh, uh, we, we, we had the school record. I think it, 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 the record did get bro broken two years ago. Um, but, uh, but we're number two on the list now, so, you know. <laughs> so. Congratulations. What do you want? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. And uh, once again, I'd like to welcome all three of you. Uh, and some, in Juan's case, he just yeah. welcomed you back in another capacity, yes. right? <laughs> OK, thank you very much. So uh, we are going to move on to uh, reports, starting with uh, Academic Senate. And I suspect that we don't have a report today. Uh, Greg probably has some 
better stuff to do today. <laughs> Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Hurst with the Costa uh, uh, President Report update. Apparently, I don't have anything better to do. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, short and sweet, um, so Tracy and I have really appreciated over the last year working with Jennifer, working with Brent, trying to figure out how we can solve problems rather than create them. And, uh, you know, negotiations are going well along those same lines. It's nice to be able to sit down and talk about working through a problem or collaborative solutions rather than taking hard line stands and, and battling these things out. Because, you know, as I've been saying up here, every time I come up here, we're, we're all in this together and uh, we're, com we're as committed as we feel Brent and the senior management are um, to work things out and collegially and you know, to everyone's benefit. So I want to thank uh, the board for that leadership. I want to thank uh, Brent and Jennifer and John for, uh, for enacting. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hurst, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, likewise with Mr. Lamar. It's always a pleasure to have him here. Don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> so we just started our negotiations with the district, what, about a week ago? Uh, we were very pleased to walk in the door and the district offered us so much and we said, you better hold off. We don't know what the budget's going to be, so we're going to meet again <laughs> just to, you know, bring the district down. I know they love us, but, you know, we've got to do something. Talk about Thank you for the first round of negotiations. <laughs> All right. That's why I said don't go too far. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up on the reports, it's uh, Kosafa, and I don't see Dr. Erickson here. Do we have a, uh, we don't have a s uh, substitute for Dr. I don't see one, no. uh, Erickson. Okay, so very good. So we will move on to uh, uh, information items, starting with the Giant Dream Center, and uh, uh, Jessica is back up at the podium. I'm back up. Okay, so I've got some flyers to pass around. I'll show the crowd. This is the flyer. Ooh, got lots more of them. So um, about 18 months ago, some faculty members, uh, some were counselors and, and one was instructional, came to me and said, hey, we've got a real need out there with our undocumented students, but we also know that College of Sequoias probably doesn't want to take a political stance on this. And so when I had them explain to me more of the issues that our undocumented students were facing, I asked if I could go along with our outreach team and, and hit some high schools to see what, what our students were up against. And so truly in assessing the student need, um, we were finding that in our outreach efforts, so our outreach specialists go to the high schools, each high school about three to five times um, prior to them registering with us in the spring. Um, you'd see pockets of students that were really, really confused. And when you'd talk to the students, they didn't know us. That was our first or second time out there. Um, they wouldn't really tell you what was going on. So in talking with the school counselors, they'd say, well, they're, they're not addressing you. They don't, they don't want to do this application. They're undocumented and they're scared. So um, I said, well, my goodness, they have nothing to be scared of coming to the college. This should be the, the least of that. So we realized we, we had some issues there. For the ones that weren't afraid, that had possibly had siblings that have gone before them, they were filling out the wrong financial aid application. So uh, dreamers need to fill out a different, form, a different application than, say, non-dreamers. Um, there's five or six different classes of undocumented. They needed some special attention. So instead, they would just not fill them out or fill them out incorrectly, which flags the IRS, which puts a hold on their financial aid. Um, we also found, as we were meeting with these students, that their families were discouraging them from coming here um, because they wanted them to fly under the radar. And so obviously that didn't sit well with us either. Um, and what I realized quickly was our students in this situation, both our current students that had made it this far and those who we were recruiting to come here, had no safe kind of point of contact, no single point of contact at the college. So often they um, would miss registration because they had flags on their residency, on their applications admissions, couldn't figure out how they would pay for anything, had heard 
that possibly they would get no financial aid at all. So kind of our response to this about 18 months ago, um, we identified a few counselors who were willing um, to get trained by Immigrant Rising, um, and we partnered closely with Fresno State. They've got an excellent uh, dream center and program. Um, we identified a financial aid and admissions specialist to help these students specifically and to get trained on what these students need. We enlisted um, involvement from our students in our clubs, our Mecha and our, our Puente Club, um, to talk to us about their experiences because often they were in the same situation. Um, and then we worked with a few highly involved academic faculty who could help us from the classroom's perspective to see what was going on there. So from that, um, we knew we needed training. We hosted an, an UndocU Ally training, um, which was hosted by Fresno State here on our campus. Um, faculty and staff had asked, you know, do you have funds to pay for us to go to this training? And I said, I don't at this point, maybe in the future. Um, 37 still attended, volunteered and attended the training and asked great questions. There was standing room only. I made the mistake of booking too small of a room, actually. Um, and from that, we established a, a, tax, a task force so we could have recommendations as to what the college needed. Um, and here's the result. You see it in front of you. Um, we had students name the Giant Dream Center. They came through, they walked around, they looked at spaces um, and agreed upon a space. Um, and actually, one of Juan Vasquez's student success labs, we had an open office. We've assigned a, uh, an, an adjunct counselor 23 hours per week. Um, with existing resources that we already had. Um, and this adjunct counselor will spearhead an ongoing work group, which pulls together the financial aid, the admissions, the counseling, the high school counselors, and as well as the free um, legitimate community resources that are out there. And there's a, there's a big piece to that because there are a lot of um, attorneys out there that will, will take some of our community members' money and not give them the services that they need. And so really just kind of trying to streamline and, and create a single point of contact. So um, what you're seeing is just a really simple flyer. We'll get some marketing going on this. Um, the Giant Dream Center will open in August when school returns. Um, and that counselor is there to help all the way from admissions um, through community resources and referrals and will also work with family members in the community. Um, the feedback from the local high schools or if you hold something in the evening and invite the families, you can get a lot further with uh, explaining how coming to college is not going to put them on the red flag list for anything that they're concerned about. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of this. The butterfly, if you don't know, is the uh, California state symbol for, um, for undocumented students, and it kind of represents the migrant path. So I don't know if you have any questions or just kind of wanted to share that. We're kind of excited that we've pulled something together on this. OK, uh, questions and, or comments? Um, you had mentioned um, uh, Immigrant Rising as a resource for training. Mm -hmm. You mentioned counselors. Is that our counselors or high school counselors? It, well, it's our counselors that, have, that are taking the training, and well, 37 of our faculty and staff. Um, if you go to certain high schools, they're far more versed than others. Um, and it's really dependent upon the administration at those high schools we're finding. And so we're hoping this new counselor can assist and go out with our outreach team and work with the counselors in the high schools to provide us a list of these students so we can contact them separately so possibly they're not having to identify in the middle of these big groups because that's, I don't blame them, they don't want to identify. Um, we had, um, during steps, we had a student that I just happened to catch out of the corner of my eye right when he got logged on. He got up and he walked out really quickly and I chased him out. I said, hey, are you okay? You feeling okay? You need a bathroom? Um, and he said, he kept whispering to me, but I couldn't hear him. But he was saying, I don't have a social, social security number and your computer won't let me pass to register until I get past that. And I said, oh, just throw zeros in. We'll catch up with you later. Took his name down. But if we can get on the front end of that, that would be obviously an ideal situation, not to mention the amount of students we're missing that aren't coming because of the fear. Yeah. I'm a little surprised that the students aren't aware of the opportunities. I'm thinking, is that a high school could be doing a better job? That yeah, correct. Just as we could be, just as we could be, they are, um, we've got pockets that, that are excellent. They give us the lists. We've targeted the students ahead of time and troubleshooted the, the issues. Um, but uh, that was one of our goals with this task force and this spear, you know, this person that can contact each high school before we come out to say, they have lists of them at the high school, please share that with us 
to the benefit of the student. So we're hoping this is a big training piece as well for our future high schools. There's a program called, I think, BK, which is like a parent education right. as well. Right, right. probably be a good, good resource. And Absolutely, yeah. There's a, a couple of them that have invited us, and we've been sending kind of hit and miss folks out there that are trained, um, but it would be great to have that, that united kind of person that can go to to all of these yeah we've got about 531 students in this scenario right now that are current students mm -hmm. do, do we have resources or have we identified resources for um, students that speak a language other than um, Spanish which you mentioned here C correct we have our ESL program which is um, a non-credit program and I would still say and I could ask dr. Lacerna but I think that probably 90 Eight percent of them are Spanish speaking. Would I be wrong to say that? Um, we have a small population that's here from China, but surprisingly, their English is is really good. Um, but no, we don't as far as the other languages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Good You're job. welcome. All right, next up is item two, the CCAP. Uh, Pathways Agreements. Jennifer, Dr. Lucerna. Yes, thank you. Um, so it, uh, several years ago, I guess about three, four years ago now, there was new legislation passed that uh, to, uh, to make the dual enrollment process a little bit easier for community colleges and the high schools. And the result of that was a college and career access pathway agreements. And these agreements allow us to I guess break a few of the rules with the new law that they created new laws for us where we could um, restrict, for example, one of the things that allowed us to do is restrict classes at a high school to sol only the high school students. And so um, this is one of the, the Agree, one of the benefits of this new law. So as a requirement of that, any of the um, career um, college and career access pathways agreements that we want to have, they need to come to both the high school board and the, the community college district board as an information item and then an action item. So these are all coming forward to you as an information item. Um, they are all new except for the Tulare Joint Union High School District. That one is a uh, uh, one that's coming back, but the rest of them are new. Um, they list in there, in each of them, the classes that we'll be offering. And for most of them, it's the Nursing 256, which is a medical terminology course. And um, that is really helping prep the, um, the students who might be interested in a medical pathway. Um, we also at um, Sequoia, uh, Lindsay will have an English 301, which is the um, co-requisite course for the um, English course. Um, and then at Tulare Joint Union High School District, again, it's, it's a continuation, but we actually have a um, full-time faculty member there who teaches in our, um, I'm trying to find that one, the technology, he teaches electrician training. And so all of those courses are also taught through a CCAP agreement, electrical training. So um, these are before you for information. Um, what it does require us, is it requires us to bring these, like I said, to both boards. And then we need to, at the end of each year, we have to report out uh, data to the chancellor's office on the results of the students attending these programs. Um, it, we have a lot of other dual enrollment classes that don't fall under these particular legislative guidelines. So those aren't necessarily coming forward to you. We have different MOUs. A couple of those are in the consent calendar today, but these ones are required to be on as info and action item to the board. I, I know we found a couple of errors that Mr. Lane sent. We're gonna fix those for that when they come back to as action. Are the electrical training mainly at the accelerated charter? That's where they are. They're at the oh, they're all there. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, any uh, other questions, comments, or? All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is the consent calendar. All items listed on consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. An item may be removed from the consent calendar at the request of any member of the board of the trustee of trustees or any person in the audience and considered as a separate agenda item. Uh, so at this time, do we have any items uh, on the consent calendar that need to be removed? Now, 
If, if not, then I would uh, entertain a motion for approval of consent calendar. Move we approve. Second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of consent calendar, items three through 14. Uh, is, are there any further uh, questions or discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to uh, item 15, academic calendar. That time again. I'll just stay up here. <laughs> um, the academic calendar, this is actually a revision because every now and then we make a mistake. Okay. Um, so this, the academic calendar, we brought this before you um, and it was approved already, but we found an error, so it's coming back. Um, just to remind you, this is, um, we get direction from the state on how, how the academic calendar should be put together, when holidays are, and things like that. But then it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle because there's a certain amount of days that we need to have and certain amount of weeks, and you can have a certain amount of Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, and so we have a calendar task force that comes together to review this. Um, my office, Con TC in my office is, I already mentioned that she was amazing earlier, but she helps us keep all of this together. And um, we have folks from Student Services, Academic Services, Academic Senate, and the three bargaining units who get together to review all of this. The error we made was a small error. It was on December 23rd. Uh, if you can see at the bottom, red is a holiday, and we had failed to include that as one of the required holidays. And so on the last version that you saw, that 23 that's red was actually green, showing that we were open that day. But we, that was the error we made, so we're change, just going back and changing that. We're actually uh, required to have that 23rd uh, as a holiday. So, I'm bringing this back with a recommendation to approve it. Superintendent Calvin didn't catch that, huh? I know, huh? What was he thinking? <laughs> I turned my own joke around on me. <laughs> <laughs> I told him he should have caught that. <laughs> Move for approval. All right, so uh, with that uh, correction, I have a motion. Second. And a second for the approval of the revised uh, academic calendar for 21-22. Uh, is there any further questions or discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we have it's uh, the uh, annual uh, student equity plan update. Is that? It is. I think I'm going to get us 16. started. I'm going to get us started and then um, Ms. Morrison and Dr. Osterk will be available for any questions. You can tell who prepared this PowerPoint. Does it work? Oh, perfect. So uh, at our last board meeting, we presented on the Vision for Success Goals, which had a, a, a pretty good portion about the Student Equity and Achievement Plan. And so we want to bring the actual equity plan back. Uh, we've been working under the uh, plan that we uh, presented and approved three years ago. Uh, now, in 2019, they've, they've changed um, some of the formatting, and so we just wanted to get it in front of you and let you see it. Much of our presentation is just some of the slides you've seen before. Um, we want to document the fact that we've shared this with various groups, including our board, so some of what you see here is just um, slides that we kind of use over and over again. You saw this last time for the vision for success. You've seen it before, at master plan and strategic plan uh, presentations. But it just kind of shows how everything within our district aligns so that we're not working in silos and that our uh, daily, weekly, monthly work aligns with our uh, state requirements. Uh, anytime we're looking at um, our objectives, we want to make sure they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> Smart. Uh, this is just, a, again, um, some of the metrics that are um, uh, being measured here, enrolled in the same community college, retained from fall to spring. Um, students complete both transfer level math and English. Uh, attain the vision for uh, success goals that we went over at last that last meeting and transfer to a four-year institution also part of the vision goals 
It's all reported here in our NOVA. And this is an example of setting goals for all of our students. You see our 17-18 baseline there for these uh, five metrics. And you'll see the goal there for 2021-22 and the overall equity change as a percentage. Uh, clearly, the, that middle one completing both transfer level English and math um, within our district in the first year is the one that we have the most work to do on. But again, AB 705 is going to put us in, in a lot better position to do that, we think, because all of our students will start in transfer level English and math uh, during their uh, first year with the district. Um, and so we are pretty optimistic that we'll be able to um, achieve that goal. Uh, additionally, we uh, set goals for our disproportionately impacted groups. That's what the acronym DIGS stands for. This is just an example. It's, it's not all inclusive, but you see for, for female foster youth as well as male foster youth students, um, simply being enrolled in the same community college from one year to another persisting from fall to fall um, is something that, that we track. And so the baseline of that top one for female students was 234, and we'd like to bump that to 275 um, by the year 2022. For African-American uh, females, re being retained from fall to spring is something we'd like to see uh, an improvement on. Again, going from 77 to 89. These are the types of things that when you really get down to the blades of grass, that's what we're working on on an equity basis. And so we'll devote resources and have specific day-to-day -day actions that align with uh, moving these numbers over the next three years. Um, again, more examples, disabled females um, enrolled in the same community college, retaining them from fall to fall. Um, uh, again, these are just the types of things that, that we, we need to review. We set our digs based on what the numbers say and then we come back and, and devote resources and come up with a plan in order to do that. So for instance, that bottom one, female um, African Americans, uh, there may be um, a baseline of 238 um, retaining from fall to fall. So we'll put in an action that will help retain our African American females from year to year. It, you see there's two col uh, columns there, one for minimum equity and one for full equity. We have chosen to pursue full equity on everything, um, but at a minimum, we need to, to, to reach that middle column for minimal, minimum equity. These are the official uh, student equity um, groups from the state. Ethnicity down the left, and then uh, foster youth, uh, those students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged veterans, our LGBT community and our homeless community. Uh, those are the other groups in addition to ethnicity. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll segregate out all of the, all the data on those students and we'll see how they measure up to, to the district-wide average. And if they fall a certain percentage below the average, they're, qual they're qualified as a disproportionately impacted group and we need to do something about them. Some information here on how those digs are identified. Here are some of the groups. Some of these are, are smaller groups than others, but these are the groups with the greatest number of dig designations. That top number, 144, that means if you take all the groups and you look at all the various uh, metrics that we measure them on, there's a total of 144 possible DIG designations. So if somebody comes up uh, four times, it's four out of a possible 144. African American males may come up on uh, being retained from fall to fall, but they may do fine in their completion of math or English or something like that. So you don't see one group falling below in all the categories. Normally, it's only in a handful. We've also started a joint planning initiative work group. This is required 
uh, to be a recipient of these categorical resources. The 15 me member group represented um, by um, all constituency groups on campus and co-chaired by the Vice President of Student Services, uh, Ms. Morrison, as well as the VP of Academic Senate, uh, Mr. Juan Arzola. They met approximately five times this past year. Uh, they're the steering group for the equity plan and they monitor the plan alignment between a strategic plan, guided pathways, and basic skills. They've done some really good work. These are the types of professional development that, that the equity allows us to pay for. And this is an example of a program that, that we identified a need with our African American students. And one of the actions was to um, get those students more engaged. And we started the HMN charter and um, have done a host of activities. Uh, I'm not sure if Mr. Vasquez is still in attendance. Doesn't look like he is, but he's been very, very influential in starting this club, and we've been recognized and, and received several awards for our work here. Ditto for the Student Success Program. This is kind of the overall umbrella that's funded by equity um, that allows us to, to work on um, or work with these these groups. You've heard it before, we have student success coordinators that are housed in student success centers across all of our campuses, and students are required as part of those programs to meet with those coordinators and student success counselors um, several times a year to continue receiving those benefits. And there's the bird that Dolly likes to throw in. Any questions that we can answer for you? There it is. Uh, Brent, when did the program come into uh, the, the student uh, uh, equity plan come into being? I believe 2015. Yeah. 2015 is when we, were, when we were funded. And so we started the student success program shortly thereafter. I want to say that Juan was hired January of 2016 when we, when we made our um, student success program kind of the feature of our equity uh, plan. And I think we are seeking um, yeah, we approval of that. Thank you, Lord. Okay. <clears throat> yes, All right, we do have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Have a motion and a second for the approval of the student equity plan. Are there any further questions, uh, discussion from anyone? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, and that moves us to item 17, I believe, uh, board uh, policies. Bring Se forward, second read. Excuse me. Bringing forward four right. uh, board policies for your approval tonight. It's the second time that we've seen these. Happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, about them. Okay, so this is our second read of uh, one, two, three. Four, four separate policies. I move we approve. Second. A uh, motion and a second for approval of uh, board policies uh, 7235, 7240, 7260, and 7310. Uh, is there any further questions or discussion? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, starting with uh, Mr. Bratch uh, has the next three items on the agenda, and these are some various agreements. First, uh, item number 18, in the community college system, the ed education code provides that administrators may be employed by either a multi-year employment agreement or by a one-year appointment. Traditionally, at the College of Sequoias, we employ our president and our vice presidents with a, a multi-year employment agreement, and all other managers are employed via a one-year appointment. Um, the item number 18 that I'm bringing forward tonight uh, has to do with one-year appointments of all of our managers here on campus. Uh, the appointment uh, period is from July 1st, through to 
July 1st, 2019 through June 30th of 2020. Uh, I've listed all the managers uh, that I'm asking be appointed for this one year period. And with that, I would ask that the board approve resolution 2019-08. Uh, Move to approve <coughs> resolution number 2019-08. Second. We have a motion and a second for <coughs> approval of resolution 2018-2019. Dash zero eight. Are there any further questions or comments regarding this resolution? Hearing none, I would ask Megan to please pull the board. Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Lane? Aye. Trustee Macarena? Aye. Trustee Nunez? Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, resolution 2019 zero eight is unanimously approved. Uh, item 19, Mr. Bratch as well. This is a, an employment agreement, a two-year employment agreement for our Vice President of Academic Services, uh, Jennifer Vega Lacerna. I would ask the, that the board formally approve this agreement. So moved. Second. Motion and a second for the uh, approval of employment agreement, item uh, 20. No, item, uh, item 19 on the, uh, on the calendar. Are there any further questions or discussion? If not, all those in favor, I, please I would say that uh, I, I, the only objection I have is the term is too short. If we could move it out <laughs> like 20 years, maybe, maybe 20. <laughs> so, all right, so uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed, motion carries, that's item 19. And uh, I believe, uh, oh, Mr. Mr. Bratch is also doing number 20. I'm sorry, I'm getting my items out of order here. You thought the last employment agreement was short at two years. Uh, this next one is only for two months. <laughs> Can we change that one too? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It must be a mistake. Yeah, uh, this is for our Vice President of Administrative Services, Christine Statton, and she has announced her, her resignation. I think we've uh, finalized a date, uh, September 2nd, but nevertheless, we would like an appointment agreement, uh, even for this short period of time. Um, so with that, I would ask that the board formally approve the employment agreement between um, the district and our Vice President of Administrative Services. So moved. Second. Motion and a second for approval of employment agreement for uh, VP of uh, Admin Services, item 20 on the uh, uh, action calendar. Uh, are there any further uh, questions or discussion? I, I would just note that, um, it, and I believe this is an overlap, is that is that correct for, for Ron? Yes. 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 And, and I think that the, um, that and that connotes extreme vision. Um, not all organizations, certainly not all public organizations, and it seems like that's almost counter uh, to, to the culture of, of, oh no, you can't have two people in the same spot. You know, that, that makes so much sense to me. I, I just, I'm baff baffled as to why other organizations don't do that. I mean, how can you take the knowledge base of someone that knows this organization inside and out and not pass that along, at least on a reasonable period of time. Uh, and, and I would, uh, my last comment is I would only vote no if that meant that you would stay. But I don't think that's the case. <laughs> Will you stay? <laughs> All right, well those comments are uh, very well taken and I think uh, that being said, uh, Christine, that means you need, uh, you have two months to impart a lot of embedded knowledge to your successor, so. No uh, pressure. Uh, She's been copying that and, poor guy with more and, emails <laughs> yeah. for the last two months. I said, can and you I wait till he signs uh, contract before you start? Yeah. I think I might work with Dolly to find some measurable things that <laughs> we can make sure that uh, right. that gets done. Tracker. So, all right, well listen, thank you for those comments and uh, I kind of forgot where I was at, but I think I need a call for a vote. Do, do uh, oh, did we ever? We, uh, we, we had yeah, done that sorry. already? All right. Okay. 
All right, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, Mr. Bratch, you're off the... All right, so uh, item 21, so uh, Ms. Statton is uh, ready for the tentative budget for 1920, so uh, relax and enjoy. Yeah, thank you. And I should clarify, I'm actually, I think August 2nd is my last day here, and then I'm burning through some vacation. But I'm more than available by phone. In fact, these guys will probably have trouble getting rid of me, or I'll have some separation anxiety or something like that. Sorry, I'm trying to get to our tentative budget. Okay, um, I know that there's a big game on. Oh gosh, it already started, and I apologize. I have a few things. Uh, um, take your time. The Warriors there'll are. Be a, there'll be another game of those uh, uh, <laughs> next you, week. Or, I think this, or this weekend. There's a chance this is the last. We'll see. Yeah, we uh, Warriors are big in our family, and I have two granddaughters who, believe it or not, learned to say curry for the three before they said mama or dada. <laughs> now, it didn't sound like that. It really did. And they do this little thing with their, anyway. But, yeah, it's, it's a big deal. They have the mouthpiece. Or? I don't know. No, they don't it's do the mouth. That's a passy. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just, huh. Bottom line, okay. you'd like to go home soon. <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I'm fine. I could talk a long time. So, um, Tentative budget. Settle in. Yeah, uh, before I start, I did want to thank, uh, give thanks, and Linda's not here tonight like she usually is, Linda McCauley, but the, the budget document itself, um, Karen Pauls does a lot of work putting together, um, and then the budget itself, Linda McCauley and Leangela Miller-Hernandez are just integral, and we work back and forth on assumptions, but they do all the, the yeoman's work, and then I just kind of wrap it up with a bow to, to present to the board. Um, our budget book deals with the general fund as a whole. Um, this is also in the board agenda tonight. It does not really break out the unrestricted, and I'm gonna break that out a little bit more for you in the PowerPoint. Um, it gives detailed uh, SCFF calculations, if anyone's interested in that, for both the whole harmless or full funding. Um, and something I use it for a lot is the beginning and ending balances of our various miscellaneous other funds. If someone says, how much do we have in Farm Special Reserve? I always pull this right up. So that's helpful in many ways. But tonight I have our um, tentative budget that we're bringing to you for approval. And as you know, we will bring a final budget in September after the state final budget is adopted and we know a lot more information. We also close out the current year and then open the next year with a final. But for our tentative, I wanted to share some items of note. It's built on 1819 base funding, and that might sound um, uh, like no big deal, but it's actually a big deal because it's not built on full student-centered funding formula funding. Um, we just felt there was no scenario in which we could do that because even for this year, we still don't know at this point in time if we're receiving SEFF funding. It sounds like we're not gonna receive all the funding. So we're taking 1819, we're rolling it forward, we're adding a COLA for this tentative budget. Even though the state proposal is for 3.26% COLA, because of those many moving parts and this roller coaster we've just come out of, we wanted to go with something a little more conservative. So we said 2%. Um, not that it'll be lowered, but something else may fall short. We'll just see. Um, so I'll give you a few more things. It's built on 10,161 FTES. Um, we don't really get paid for our full FTES. It's averaged for three years at a time now. So it's not as big of a deal, but, but do know that right now we're tracking a lot higher for summer. It could come in at 10,200 or even a little more, but that's what it's built on. That's what we were back about March when we when started this process. We're assuming zero growth in 1920 for 1819. Looks like we're come, gonna come out close to even. We'll talk more about that. It assumes plant, ma plant maintenance and instructional support, which is also scheduled maintenance and instructional equipment funds. This is the amount uh, that the state says we're getting. We budgeted this time 117,000 to instructional equipment and 200,000 to scheduled maintenance. Usually we split those 50-50, but we chose to do a little more for scheduled maintenance since instructional equipment received an additional 800,000 last year from our district one-time funds. So uh, scheduled maintenance has been limping along on about 200,000 for the last couple years. So they can use anything that we can give them. 
Uh, basic skills building, this gets off our tentative budget assumptions a little bit, but I wanted to update you. We expect to receive approval of those funds uh, in July. We're awaiting the governor's final approval. Then uh, the chancellor's office has said to us that it looks very promising. Everyone has said that, so we're hopeful. Uh, the funds for the design phase would be received in July. Design would commence late summer, uh, this summer, and construction would be scheduled for 2020 through 2022. I'm thinking demolition uh, would be summer 2020, but I did not confirm that with this guy over here, but I, am I close? 21? Shoot, I'm off a whole year. Sorry, you guys. Um, but we do, I do have anticipated occupancy, correct, of 2023? Yeah. So exciting things to come there. Uh, restricted programs, these are some of the larger programs, guided pathways, uh, about that 350,000 mark again this year. Uh, we receive a an amount for five years. It's not ongoing. Uh, College Promise, if you recall, almost 400,000 for last year. This is that double amount, 764 for two years. And we think that'll be more than enough for our needs. Um, student success and support is equal to prior year. SEP, student equity, is equal to prior year. Strong workforce, kind of equal to prior years. It's actually um, increased by 133,000. But these are, uh, you hear a lot about SWP because that's a lot of dollars. We have almost 700,000 that comes to the region and almost 1.3 million uh, per year on average that comes to us at COS. Uh, Pers and stirs increase costs. Uh, let's see. For board member Macarena and Lane, uh, you may not have heard how we've been tackling these in the past, but um, we these were such big chunks to, to bite off for our budget. We've decided to budget two years in advance. So 1920 had already been budgeted, 510,000 give or take in the last couple years. Uh, 2021 had already been budgeted, um, 804.7K. And then this year we're budgeting for 2122. And that's only 500, I'm sorry, 153.6K. Um, that will be budgeted two years in advance. I'm gonna show you the next slide. Only 127,000 remains to be funded by us to cover what they currently project. Now, if you, if you notice these numbers changing a little bit year to year, especially in this next slide, it's because we have um, our costs for salaries change every year, mostly increase. And then state pers and stirs actuaries do their actuarials and based on markets, everything fluctuates. But this is a slide, a little hard to read, but I do enjoy showing this to you. Four point, almost 4.4 million is our total annual increase that we will have accomplished within our general fund increased costs that um, we didn't know we were gonna have to be paying just maybe eight years ago. But you can see that our increases were already budgeted right in between these two lines are what are included in this year's budget. 20 to, besides already paying for 1920, which we owe. But 804.7, or 804.706 for 2021 and 21.22, 153,000. And um, that's the only remaining amount there, 127,409. Uh, small caveat, um, these numbers right here, STRS employer rate, they were gonna march up to 19%. This year's state budget, the governor uh, chose to uh, um, commit some state funds to help the employer rate. So it went down and hence kind of a little negative number there and then nothing due for the out years. So that was good news. So we're, we're in a very good place for our PERS and STRS increased costs. Um, this, we track enrollment with an enrollment management group. We follow our FTES. And this is about where we were, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, I, I would say, with our projections. Uh, summer is just a guess. That's actually tracking closer to 600 right now. This number for positive attendance is also a complete guess. That I'll have that number in just a few days. But uh, just so you know, last year, our true number was 10,249 before we shifted a little. So we're really not far off, especially if we end up close to 10,200. Um, this tracks all our FTS history. I'm getting uh, so many numbers on here, it's hard to fit it on one page. So when Vice President Perez comes, he'll have to decide if he wants to kick off some years. But um, you can see that we did have those few years where we really tried to re reach or exceed the 10,000 mid-sized college status, but we were not funded for it. Uh, since then, we bounced around a little bit to reach the reduced mid-sized college status, and then we have reached it the last few years. 
And there's that 10,161 that our budget's built on, but it, we might end this year 10,178 or 10,200. Uh, by the way, if we end this year above 10,161, we will adjust our budget up fairly soon after that, and then the state will respond with funding. Usually, um, we build a current year budget on the prior year, so you'll probably see that in final. Um, this, we got the correct slide in here. Now, uh, these are our costs of step and column for this year, much higher than we've had in prior years, but that just happens to be how everyone was hitting their step movement. Cost of 1% for unrestricted is 470,000. Cost of 1% combined is 564,000. This fiscal solvency that you're gonna see is only unrestricted. Oh, you guys may not have the I right one. I think we have the old one. Yeah, I yeah. just, we caught that mistake uh, just this afternoon and changed this out. We can email you that if you need to. Um, and I apologize, I grabbed an old slide. The one you have is exactly what our numbers were last year. Yeah. So <laughs> they've uh, gone up. Um, anyway, we take the, we do not take the cost of 1% because that's yet to be negotiated, but we take the cost of step and column among all those other assumptions. And then we assume our new revenues. Uh, this really, the only, zero growth, the only same thing we are assuming for next year is a 2% COLA um, night in revenue. 2021, we're assuming zero growth again and a 1% COLA, and 21-22, zero growth and a 1% COLA again. Who knows what those COLAs will be, but that's just a conservative approach, and we always feel that zero growth is a conservative approach. Um, and then we take <coughs> these and we build them along with some other new expenditures that we've adopted. You might have heard us uh, speak of the Tier 1 and Tier 2 base budget augmentations. We went through a whole process with our um, district this spring and we approved those. I'll show you a number of those in a moment. We have 19 new faculty in our unrestricted size, 4.5 faculty retirements. There really wasn't a 0.5 retiree, just some people that were on Willie Brown that left in pieces there. So, um, And then we do pre-budget pre the person stirs, which we talked about. So all of that builds up to kind of this one big slide to show you this is the budget that is before you in the tentative budget, 71.5 million in revenues and 68.2 million in expenditures, leaves a structural surplus of 3.25 million almost. Um, and again, that is assuming that 2% COLA. We may end up getting the 3.26% COLA from the state. We will know a lot in about 10 days to two weeks. Um, 2021 and 2122, not gonna go line by line, but basically we take our expenses from the year before, move them up to the next year, and build in what we anticipate to be some of the differences, the, the differences we're committed to. We don't put in any um, tier two expenditures, our tier one are usually mandatory, um, and we don't assume excessive retirees or anything like that. But the good news is that we're in a comfortable surplus position even two years out. So very thankful to be in that position. Okay, I'm not gonna read all the rest of these, but I wanted to tell you we have 32, some very uh, small but a few larger uh, resource allocations that were our tier one and tier two and new staffing allocations that were approved this year. These are all in the tentative budget. We take a moment and try and tie them to our mission, our goals, and the objectives that underlie those goals. And so I dealt with the first 16, and I did a bunch of slides. This is the mission, the goal one, goal two, uh, objectives for goal two. Then we did goal three, and the objectives for goal three, and oops, goal four, and the objectives for goal four. And we try and put an X next to what do they tie to? What are we supporting with these um, new resource allocations? And I'm not gonna go, there's so many this year, I'm not gonna go through all of them. And then since there were 32 allocations, I took the next 16 and did the same thing, starting with the district mission, goal one, goal two, and so on. So each of these slides is not a new resource allocation, it just happens to be the same ones uh, dealing with the different goals and objectives. Um, and I hope you find that helpful. We like it for tracking and for accreditation purposes and everything like that. Uh, there are many that just fit right there in goal four for best practices, staff development, and probably many of these are admin services related since there's all those access. 
Um, moving on, hopefully quickly, our categorical programs. This shows you what's changed for 1920 over 1819, and really not much in, in change has occurred. One of the largest is this basic skills, uh, let me think, and opportunity for student, no, I forget, it's BSSOT. Basic skills, student opportunity, and transformation. That's what it was. That went away, so you can see there was about a $500,000 drop in funding there. Um, the only other real large change was College Promise, moving up from 414 to 764. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else of note there. But those are our categorical programs, and that, that's all of our categorical programs, state-funded categorical. Um, the next few slides show our farm funds and then other funds. So farm funds I want to go through pretty quickly, but these are our ag instruction units. You can see they all have a deficit. No, they're not meant to be self-supporting. They're not meant to generate a revenue. In fact, we're just very fortunate that some of our ag uh, instruction units do generate a small revenue, but they have these expenses that go with them. And we charge them, we track it here. We don't charge faculty. The only large salary is um, a technician, I believe, in ag tech who helps with all of our programs and um, our, the, the items that are needed to be done, you know, whether you have swine or sheep or equine, the horses, it's not all during an eight-hour day. Um, and so that results in a $152,000 loss, um, not unexpected at all. Please note we have lottery funds that we also give these programs of 60,000. That 60 doesn't help cover that loss, that's separate. Uh, expenditures that each of these units choose to spend those funds on. So, um, but that's some additional funding that they have. And then that kind of combines with our farm funds. You know we run crops. If Luann was here, she could speak in detail about all of these. But we run a lot of different crops. We also have some overhead costs um, for some general contractors that help us run the farm. We rent out a residence. You add all that up and you have um, 381,000 in expense, 499 or 499,000 in revenue, and 117,000 net profit. You combine that 117 with that loss you saw in the prior slide, and it nets to about a $34,000 loss. Uh, small note right in the middle, these almonds, the 80,000, that's an expenditure for budget authorization, but I think at the end of the year it won't show as an expense. It'll be capitalized until those trees start producing. So that uh, deficit should become positive in a perfect world. That's what would happen as we closed out the year. Um, other funds, uh, these are the other funds. And it shows uh, the, all the expenditures that are budgeted. It also shows the revenue, if applicable. And so comparing the expenditures and the revenue, you can see a surplus or deficit. Capital projects, I don't want anyone to freak out over that 6.6 .6 million. Uh, I just got a list of what all's in there, but it has large things, kind of like the, I think it's 2.1 or 2.2 million for the tech infrastructure upgrade. That's budgeted. Uh, I think the full 750,000 for the artificial turf replacement is in there. Um, we probably had four big ticket items and I'm forgetting some of them. They may or may not all be completed next year, but, but we budget the expenditures. We just don't have matching revenues coming in. We, we use fund balance for that. Um, and then we get into all our bond budgets and please know that the assessor's office tracks all this and the county does these calculations for us and we just put down what they say we need to budget is really how it works. Um, I think that's it for other funds. And last slide, in closing our books this year, and this really has to do with another uh, board item coming up, um, we usually always have some excess funds fall. And so we are hoping to make a decision to approve various capital projects and transfer one-time funds uh, to the capital projects fund here as we close. Th so that will reduce our excess funds at the close of this year. You'll see that in a minute. But also, we do estimate additional funds falling. Um, Leangela and I try and track this. Lately, we've been tracking it about every week. And it's actually looking like maybe over a million right now, even after transferring those funds out. And it just comes from unspent budgets or small projects or requested carryovers. Um, and then the tentative budget assumes starting the year with 31.25% fund balance. Uh, just real quickly, we're about at about 33% now. So you would think, how are we going down? if we have money fall. Uh, 
we have higher expenditures this year. So about the same dollar amount of fund balance mm -hmm. compared last year to this year just makes it a smaller percentage. So any questions or comments? Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're, uh, and I think I'm right on this and I apologize. That game's but, over, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Christine, so yeah. the, uh, the categorical uh, total of 11874 uh -huh. that is in addition to the, our, uh, our um, general fund revenue of 71. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. and that is, that is, is, is that considered general fund or is that considered? You know, it's considered general fund, but it's restricted general fund. Okay, got so it. So you'll often hear me say right. unrestricted general fund or okay. GFU, general right. fund unrestricted. And so this has all of that combined whenever you see yep. general fund. All right. So uh, we're open for questions and comments. Uh, John? Uh, the basic... basic uh, skills building, uh, it, it all looks good and that sort of thing, but in the worst case scenario, that should not be funded. It simply pulls out, right? It doesn't have any uh, anticipated costs that, that we wouldn't be able to cover if the funds were not oh, there to do that. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, next month, we hope and plan to bring an architect to the board for approval for starting that process but we will not be bringing that unless uh, the state has approved the funds. And I think we might see the funds by July or, or very soon after, yeah. So we haven't committed anything at this point. We did commit a 10% match, which was 1.67 million, and that still sits in capital projects. Yeah. It won't be due until the final stages of that project, right? Furniture and things like that, equipment phase at the very end. And then just a, a comment, the, um, the pay ahead uh, on the person stirs a, a high compliments to my, uh, my board, fellow board members that have been here longer than I have. Uh, it, that's precisely the, the right way to invest funds into the future, and it really helps, in my opinion, to uh, uh, equalize things. If, if things go bad, it, one of those things that will absolutely pay off especially in the hard times. But, uh, anyway, so sure. great job on that. No other questions. Anybody else? I move to approve our tentative budget. All right, we have a motion. Oh, second. second. No, go ahead. A second. Uh, Raymond uh, with a second. Uh, are there any further uh, questions or discussion. Christine, you did a thorough job, and uh, so we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And I, as I recall, this is, uh, we're going to get a much, this is uh, it's pretty thinner. thin compared to what I used to remember seeing. So My smaller print. Uh, uh, <laughs> highly encouraged us to print double-sided, so that helped. Yeah. <laughs> but it is small. All right, so uh, if there are no further questions or comments, all those in favor of approval, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Very good. Looks really good. So uh, with that, we're going to call up um, our Dean of Facilities, Byron Woods, and uh, we have a uh, five-year construction plan. Yes, good evening. So this is the uh, proposed five-year construction plan for the years 2021 through 2025. Uh, the district is required to submit the five-year construction plan to the chancellor's office every July. And you'll notice the year 2021, we plan two years in advance. Um, that's that, that term right there. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and skip to the attached list that you have. That's probably easiest to start there. So, these are the list of projects that we were proposing to include in the five-year construction plan. They're the same exact projects we submitted last year. However, the uh, statuses have changed slightly, uh, most notably in the basic skills center. As Vice President Staten um, talked about, um, we are hopeful that the uh, state will, or that the governor's budget will include this project uh, for funding. If so, we are off and running very quickly. Um, she mentioned that we are interviewing for architects. 
So we will be interviewing in next week, actually. Yeah, it's exciting. So we have five different architectural firms that we'll be interviewing. Um, and then hopefully, if the funding is approved, we will bring one of them to the, um, for a recommendation for a contract in, uh, at the July board meeting for this project specifically. So for those of you who don't know, the Basic Skills Center building will take the place of Buckeye and General Grant over on the uh, southeast corner of campus here on the Visalia campus. Um, it's approximately $16.9 million total project cost, 11.8 would be for the construction of the project. And then uh, she did run through a, a brief schedule there, but we're looking at occupancy in spring. Uh, the district is on the hook for the 10% match, uh, which would be required just about towards the end of the project. Um, so in the 2022, actually it might be the 21-22 budget when we actually have to bring forward the funds. Uh, moving over to Tulare, we're resubmitting the Tulare Center Phase 2 project. This has been uh, resubmitted for the past few years. Um, and that's pushed off to 2025-26 occupancy date. That is completely determined by the scoring of the project. We have to find the sweet spot of when the project scores well. And that's the soonest it would score well at the state level. So we will resubmit that as an IPP. That is an initial project proposal. Uh, moving on down to number three, the education expansion in Hanford. This project was initially uh, introduced at the state level um, last year for the first time. It was submitted as an initial project proposal. It scores very well considering the, uh, the need for those types of spaces in Hanford. We will resubmit it as a final project proposal this year. And the tentative occupancy date is noted right there, 2025-26 and the construction total project and construction costs are noted there as well. Um, you'll notice at the very bottom that the project number two and three, both Tulare and Hanford, that is 100%, but we are proposing it to be 100% state funded. No local match by the district at this point. Um, the state is revising their scoring requirements for projects, um, and there is a chance that they may have districts put forth up to 25% of a local match for future state uh, funded projects. That wouldn't be finalized until next year, I think. Um, so it's something to think about moving forward. And then uh, the next project on the Visalia campus, assuming basic skills gets funded, is the current building modernization project listed right there. Um, that will be resubmitted as an, I, as an IPP, initial project proposal. Um, and then once basic skills is completed, it will actually be submitted as an FPP next year, a final project proposal. So with that, we are seeking a recommendation for the board to authorize the 2019 submittal of the 2021 to 25 five-year construction plan. Any questions? All right. Uh, questions for uh, Mr. Woods. I'm sure we have some. I, yeah. I have one, and I, I probably can wait till item 25, but just to, uh, just to clear up in my mind what's happening. Um, I believe, um, did I see it correct? We're on item 25. We're allocating some money to renovate some of the current building. Is the current modernization does not include then that? Is that? So the current modernization would be completely gutting the current building, the two story um, instructional building, uh, as well as adding a new elevator. That's Got much it. needed. Yep. Um, the uh, proposed funding you're looking at, I think it's $300,000 just yeah. for the office renovations. Yeah, that's, I hope you're right. Yeah, there's. $300,000 of it is for current. Oh, okay. And various office renovations. So there are two particular office suites over in the current building that we're looking at modernizing. <laughs> that are underutilized at this point. Okay, well, and so is it is it fair to say then in five to six years those could be gutted? Potentially, it took 10 years for basic skills to get funded. Okay. So I wouldn't get your hopes up of actually moving into the current building in 2024. Okay. But at least All we right. have to have a next step in the queue at the state level. Yep. Just in case the state says, yes, let's go ahead and fund some more projects. And is some of that equipment or something, or is that all like fundamental structure change that would be really? Just general construction. Okay. Finish it. And then the, the office, what, what we're doing now with the 200,000 is is finding space for our 19 new full-time faculty members. Got it, That's okay. That's a real challenge. Yeah, I think your concern was, are we going to double it spend? Prudent? Yep, yep, yeah. yep. It's just a large chunk of money. I mean, if it was, I understand something needs to be done for maintenance, but it seems like a lot of money to build something that's going to be torn down in the next 10 years, it seems like it, it didn't really have time to depreciate, but if it's necessary for instruction, then that answers my question. Well, $200,000 yeah. on the offices, and I'm, I'm not sure that we would that we would completely gut it, but maybe maybe we would. I mean, we're talking about taking a huge space and, and, and um, uh, 
kind of making it s small enough to, to have 100 square foot officers or whatever they whatever they are. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure that when that's funded even 10 years from now that, that we wouldn't change it that drastically. I don't, I don't know. Okay, okay. The 10% uh, the, the match. Yes. And I think that's probably a wise thing to do. Have, have we seen evidence that that, that actually pays off on a, a year to year that it dramatically changes its ranking? Or? Can't say yes. Okay. You do receive, the district would receive a few points towards the total project score for the local contribution. However, at this point, at, the, at that point in the conversation when they did request the local funding, I think it was more of a political move. Yeah. It was. It was kind of shared like if you want to have any hope. Right. <laughs> yeah. oh, we're not twisting yeah. your arm, but <laughs> we need some money. Get in the game. I'll just add, um, the state is, I, it's moving right along to require 25, yeah. and not up to 25%, but to require 25% of the state's whole new outlook is that every district should have some, you know, contribution. Yeah. Um, we would not have 25% for these unless we passed bonds, mm -hmm. you know. But I did want to Might be able to get in there, Might squeeze it in there just in time. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it almost begs the question that that if we could seed it with a, a little bit of money, as opposed to waiting and, and paying the twenty five percent, it would that yeah would that it may deserve some conversation. I don't know. I, I, I'm not changing anything here. I'm mm -hmm. thinking out loud. Well, that's what we did with the basic skills. I mean several years we were supposed to get funded and, and didn't and then last year at this time uh, they said if you really want this opportunity before the laws change and the rules change you may think about pointing that 10 percent and, and we, that's a game changer that basic skills we'll, we'll do another presentation just on the basic skills center and you start to see it's a game changer for how we operate as a district I think just the, the number of offices and uh, space that it that it opens up on our the rest of our campus. I move we approve the construction plan five year. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. I had a uh, uh, so I had a, a question uh, mm -hmm. for Byron. So uh, and maybe this is might be a rehash, but based on what you know today, do, do you foresee w which project do you foresee happening first? The the Tulare the Tulare uh, Phase Two project, or the or the Hanford uh, expansion, uh, or is that a fair question? Or I would say the I mean, Hanford project scores much better okay, so than the Tulare project. However, it's the state allows us to have one project at each site, <coughs> so we don't. They're not necessarily. I mean, they're in particular order on here, but each campus has their primary project. Yeah, so the, the, the order here isn't necessarily indicative of, uh, of how it will be funded. And, no. and so, so let me ask you this with respect to uh, the Tulare uh, uh, project. Uh, could, if it comes to a match, and depending on what that match is, is, is our bonding capacity, could that be part of that funding? Is that a fair question? Or? We sure hope so. Well, you mean re redo the bonds we already have? You're not um, talking about that. No, I think the, if I'm There's not enough there. The bonds we have not enough capacity. give no, us I understand. authority. They give us authority, but we don't have the assessed No, I, I, that I understand. If there, was, that if there was, if there was, just say assuming that, you know, we've issued 30, we had capacity for 60, yeah. and so assuming that there was capacity uh, for another 15 million, let's say, that could be part of the funding for that project. Almost definitely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So that's my. And I think we have. I think we have twenty. I think we've we've spent. 
Yeah, I think we've spent 38 or 40. Of okay, our when we went, we went back and we did that. Mm -hmm. to, to we've got that. we've got 20 in authorized, but um, we can't get at it until the assessments go up. Sure. So the option, if we wanted to do it in the next certainly five years, we would have to pass another bond in that SFID. Allowing more per yeah. hundred thousand. Pass a separate yeah. bond. Right. No, I understand. Yeah, that's not something yeah. I'm. Yeah. I'm uh, <coughs> advocating. Necessarily for advocating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So you've answered let's the question. Let's make sure that's five minutes. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Are there no further comments or questions? All those in favor, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woods. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, next up is our. 2019 Educational Protection. This is a resolution. Uh, uh, 2019-05. Seemed like we approved 08 just yeah. earlier. But. Oh, maybe so. Uh, this ha this <laughs> resolution uh, request comes every year. It is based on Prop 30 that was passed in 2012. Uh, we had both a quarter cent sales tax uh, implemented and then a higher tax on the wealthy in California. They pulled back the quarter cent, but since the higher tax remained ongoing, we have to annually tell the public where, where and how we're spending the Education Protection Act dollars. And if you get to the last sentence of the resolution, um, it says that the governing board of the College of Sequoia CCD has determined to spend the monies received from the EPA as attached. And our attachment simply says that we receive eight points, uh, or eight million seven hundred sixty two thousand seven hundred seven dollars and we plan to spend it on instructional salaries and benefits so it's basically just saying it won't be administration it won't be classified or other discretionary budgets all right move to approve um, resolution 2019-05 second I have a motion a second for approval of resolution 2019-05. Uh, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, Megan, <coughs> would you please poll the board? Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Lane? Aye. Trustee Macarena? Aye. Trustee Newman? Aye. Thank you. Resolution 2019-05 is uh, approved. Next to another resolution, 2019-06. And this is a resolution to give uh, administration the authority to transfer funds in a, a manner of a loan between funds if needed. Don't anticipate this will be needed at all. In fact, I considered not bringing it forward. But um, should the state do something crazy and decide to withhold funds, uh, say defer our revenue for four or five months. Which they've done before. Yes. <laughs> and um, our payroll is over $5 million a month, and all of our expenditures are about $6.1 million a month. So oh. it would only take about four months to run out of money. Um, so we do have almost $5 million in some funds identified on page 15 of our budget book. But this would give us authority to, in an emergency or worst case scenario, transfer funds to the general fund on a loan basis. All right. I move we approve resolution 2019-6. Second. Resolution, uh, we have a motion and a second for approval of resolution 2019-06. All those in favor, uh, if there are no further uh, questions or comments, uh, would you please uh, uh, Megan, poll the board once again. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Lane? Aye. Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Macarena? Aye. Trustee Nunez? Aye. All right. So I thought we had misnumbered our resolutions, but uh, we did not. We got there. <laughs> uh, They're all there. Huh? So uh, we have uh, one last resolution for today, 2019-07, uh, regarding uh, and time um, transfers. Okay, um, I, I'll try not be too wordy, but this is something we brought last month to give you the idea of planned expenditures. It's based on the assumption that we will have excess unrestricted general fund dollars here in 1819 as we close the year. 
a lot of that due to the fact that we have the new funding formula and we chose not to spend all our funds, plus the revenue's been going up and down and up and down. And now we, we know about where we're gonna end the year. Um, so we presented these one-time fund ideas uh, last month. We also uh, presented a proposal and approved a resolution, a resolution in October for uh, five million in one-time funds. So this is a year with this new funding formula, a pretty unique year. Um, but what we have today is, I call it kind of a delicate dance because we're trying to really drill down to what we might have uh, left over, but to leave a cushion so we're comfortable there. And this is based on what we believe the excess we're gonna have now that we know we should receive at least the constrained formula for 1819, plus the dollars that we usually have fall at the end of the year. And um, the reason we're doing it now, I wanna try and explain this is, uh, you, this year we had these revenues that are creating this surplus or this excess. And if we wait until next year to spend these dollars, then it falls to fund balance, makes us, gives us a larger fund balance, Next year, we don't have any comparable revenues, so we reach into fund balance, budget those expenditures, and now we have deficit spending. So it's not the end of the world, but it's just much preferable to spend these dollars here in June. Um, so what we have tonight is a proposal uh, for a resolution to approve that, but first I wanted to remind you that we, um, we feel it's prudent to spend these so that our fund balance doesn't grow, but we will not execute the transfer if the calculated 1819 budget and revenues um, concludes that there's not sufficient funds at the end of the year. So we're kind of asking for your approval, and then we'll hear the June state budget adoption. We'll close out 1819, know mostly what we're receiving. Um, I tried to explain in there some of how the calculation and, and how we came up with these dollars. We feel very comfortable in them. But also attached is the list, and I didn't know if you had any questions. These are the same list that came last month, but any concerns or questions there? So um, happy so, to answer questions. Yeah, so this list is, is the list we saw last month as an information item. It yeah, is. Right. Um, last month had a lot of additional items, okay. and it had a tentative cutoff. Ah. The tentative cutoff, I think, was about 100000 less than this. Okay. Um, we felt like we could get it to $2.5 million but we had to skip over a few high dollar items. <laughs> so one being the uh, payoff of the LRB, yeah, lease revenue bond. All right, questions, comments? Move to approve resolution 2019-07. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval of resolution 2019-07. Uh, Megan, would you please pull the board? Trustee Cardoza? Aye. Trustee Margarino? Aye. Trustee Lane? Aye. Trustee Sherman? Aye. Trustee Nunez? Aye. All right, resolution uh, 07 is approved. Thank and you. that is the last item on our agenda for today. Uh, I did want to uh, acknowledge or ask, uh, I'm looking right at it, Mr. Uh, Lamar, uh, is my understanding correct that this may be your last uh, 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 meeting in an official in an official capacity? Looks like July's meeting will be my last day here. Oh. oh. So once I finish the meeting in July, that will be my last day to finish up my vacation. All right, so so that means I have uh, one more meeting. So that means I have about 30 days to. Uh, yeah. Uh, One more shot at to take a shot at to take a shot at you. Let's turn that into a roast. So that's <laughs> July eighth, right? The next meeting. Yeah. Well, the first is a Monday, yeah. so yeah. it'll be the eighth. Well, July eighth. And Steve, I won't be here at the July meeting. I'll be gone. So I just, uh, I know I'm going to see you again. But thank you for all you've done for this college, and I will miss seeing you in that back row. <laughs> Even though you didn't come to the podium much, I will miss seeing you. So thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, no further uh, business. The uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for being with us for the whole meeting. <laughs>